Northampton Democratic City Committee, and we welcome you to the candidates' night tonight. Um, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this event. That's the Daily Hampshire Gazette, WHMP, Northampton Media, and NCTV. Uh, NCTV and WHMP are both broadcasting this event live tonight. So thank you to our sponsors. And I'd also like to thank our panelists, uh, Stan Moulton of the Daily Hampshire Gazette and Mary Cerise, who is somewhere around, hopefully will be joining us shortly. Um, and finally, I wanted to thank the candidates tonight, both for the Register of Deeds and for the Governor's Council, who agreed to attend tonight and participate. And finally, thanks to Donna Riley, who's going to be our moderator tonight. She's going to be introducing the uh, panelists and the candidates. Donna is an associate professor of engineering at Smith College and has been a resident of Northampton for 11 years. She holds a PhD in engineering and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University, and her research concerns relationships among science, technology, and society. So please welcome Donna, who's going to take it from here. <laughs> Thanks, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, the forum is going to be structured as follows. Um, each candidate will be allotted two minutes for an opening statement. Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> is there, should I be? How about now? Better? Okay, maybe I'll stand up. Yeah, <laughs> I can do this. The mics are broadcast. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so do I need to be near it? Okay. How about is this good? All right. Um, so the forum is as follows: Each candidate will be given two minutes for an opening statement and one minute for a closing statement, and then between these statements, the candidates will be asked to answer questions first from the panel and then from the audience. And in a minute, Elizabeth and Joe will be distributing index cards to collect your questions. And the questions for the candidates will be drawn from those index cards. I should say that the um, order, the speak both the seating order and the speaking order were determined ahead of time by random drawing of numbers. Um, and every candidate will be given the chance to answer the same question. So with that, I think I will introduce our panel. Um, who will be asking questions. And uh, first is Stan Moulton, who has worked at the Daily Hampshire Gazette for 36 years and is now the political editor as well as the online editor. And to Stan's left is Mary Serez. Mary is a multi-platform journalist in the Pioneer Valley who got her start with the Valley Advocate and Valley Free Radio, moved on to found Northampton Media, and whose radio news can be heard on WHMP and Clear Channel affiliates throughout New England. As they are passing out index cards, I'll introduce the panel. I mean, sorry, the candidates. <laughs> um, so first I'm going to start with Mary Olberding, who is on the far left. A lifelong democratic activist, Mary Olberding holds a master's degree in human resources management and extensive experience as a human resources manager. Currently vice chair of the Belchertown Finance Committee, Mary lives in Belchertown with her husband, Jim Galinas, and their three children. And to Mary's left is George R. Zimmerman, 56, currently the Northampton City Treasurer. George is the independent candidate for the position of Register of Deeds. He is an attorney and member of the Massachusetts Bar with nearly 20 years of experience in real estate and estate planning. He is a Westfield native who attended college, business, and law school in Western Mass, and who has resided in Northampton since 1984 with his wife, deceased attorney Robin Zimmerman, and their four <laughs> children. And to George's left is Tim O'Leary, a real estate attorney with a private practice in East Hampton. He now resides in Southampton with his wife Meredith and their three daughters. And on the far right, Bonnie McCracken, is a professional land title examiner who has been in the business of researching registry documents for 25 years. She has the expertise to recognize improperly executed documents and to protect the property records of Hampshire County residents. 
An example of her interest in doing more to serve the public was her initiation of an amendment to recently signed legislation that protects the homes of deployed troops from foreclosure. So welcome to the four of you. Thank you. And I think that we're ready to start. Okay, thank you. Uh, who gets the first question first? Oh, we have, oh, don't we? Oh, have, oh, oh, uh, oh sorry, opening statements. <laughs> no, sorry. sorry, I said what the rules were. <laughs> I'm not Kevin Sullivan. Either. Yes. Okay, uh, so I begin. Sorry. Good evening. And thank you to the organizers for this forum and for everyone for taking an interest in this election. I would especially like to thank IBEW Local 2324 and the Amherst Firefighters Local 1764 for their endorsements of my campaign. Each and every day, I get to do something I really enjoy. I'm a land title examiner and a small business owner here in Pioneer Valley. I've had the honor and the privilege of researching the title deeds to your homes and the history of our communities through the public land records at the Registry of Deeds. Our deeds tell our story, and I've been telling our stories and teaching others to do the same for more than 25 years. Attorneys hire me to search the land records because of my expertise and knowledge of how to ascertain the information from our land records and to find errors, easements, and other encumbrances that affect property rights. I have an in-depth, hands-on knowledge of how the Registry of Deeds functions and how documents affect your property. After learning that more than 5,000 soldiers nationwide had lost their home to foreclosure while deployed, I researched, initiated, and submitted legislation that protects our soldiers from foreclosure. I initiated this last year with the help of Representative Story. She submitted it as an amendment to the Valor Act. It was adopted and signed into the law by the governor this past May and implemented by our Secretary of State in July. My legislation expands our declaration of homestead benefits for the benefits of protecting our soldiers. All they do is check a box at the registry on a form that's recorded at the Registry of Deeds. Our elected officials are elected and have a fiduciary duty to serve their community. The register should not only protect the deeds and title documents, but protect our homes. Oh, is that time? So we only get a, excuse me, I'm sorry. We only get a 15 minute warning instead of a, thir a 15 second versus a 30? I gave you oh, okay. a okay. Okay. Right. okay, so there's a minute warning and a 15 second warning. Okay. okay. <laughs> You're next. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for having me here and, and all our sponsors. <clears throat> uh, the Register of Deeds has a great responsibility of maintaining and overseeing all of our, our land records, our transactions. Um, and for most of us, that's our most important asset, our homes, our land. Um, and this is what I do. Um, as I said before, it's right in my wheelhouse. Uh, I'm a practicing real estate attorney. I took over my father's practice in 2003 in East Hampton. Um, I have extensive knowledge of real estate transfers. Um, I've done hundreds of real estate closings, uh, draft and review thousands of documents for recording. And I use the registry quite a bit, almost on a weekly basis. Uh, so I, I know the job, uh, and more importantly, I know how it needs to be done right. <clears throat> and there are, there are recording standards where when a document comes in, it must meet certain standards to be recorded. Well, not every document fits neatly into those standards, and you'll need a register with the knowledge of the real estate law to apply and interpret those standards. Uh, for the past nine years, I've been serving my, my clients, protecting their interests, and the citizens of, of East Hampton and surrounding communities. <coughs> Excuse me. And I would take that same dedication to my position as register for the, for the citizens of Hampshire County. I want to make the registry more visible, accessible, uh, I'd actually get out and meet people. I have a talk scheduled coming up in East Hampton on the homestead changes at the Council of Aging. Um, and I think the registry is an important asset or tool for schools, colleges, local schools can bring students through to see what we do. So in short, I think this is ideal for my skill set and I think it's more importantly a, a good opportunity to make an impact, a positive impact on the community. It's Mary. 
Thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me. I've always believed that government exists for the good of the people. I have been a Democrat since before I was born. I started campaigning for Democrats in Ohio where I grew up at age five when my parents threw me out of the family station wagon to do lit drops. In Ohio, Democrats needed all the help they could get. I was a progressive before we called ourselves that. I was the only kid in my third grade class to boycott grapes in support of the United Farm Workers and Cesar Chavez. Most recently, I worked on Dave Sullivan's campaign for two years. I think I met most of you here working on that campaign. I believe in the same democratic values you believe in, women's rights, workers' rights. That's why my lawn signs have a union bug on them. Marriage equality, education, health care for all. These democratic values should be represented at every level of government, even an office that not everyone's heard of. Currently, I'm on the Finance Committee in Belchertown, where I live. I'm vice chair. I joined to advocate for the schools and for the library. I got my first taste of public service on the Finance Committee, and I loved it. The deep passion that I feel for politics and the responsibility of government has become a call to public service for me. Electronic filing and the challenges of the economy will have an effect on the way the registry operates in the future. The recent foreclosure crisis highlights the absolute necessity for proper record keeping. That requires a strong manager. I have a master's degree in human resource management. I finished first in my graduating class. I have been a human resource manager and managed my own department, my own staff, budgets, records, and the technology that's integrated those records. As Register of Deeds, I want to preserve the old records with new technology and protect old traditions with new leadership. All right, uh, George. Good evening. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be here this evening. I am George R. Zimmerman, independent candidate for Register of Deeds. My message is quite simple. I believe that this position should not be about politics. It should be about getting the job done. I'm running in this race without the endorsements of others. I'm running without the backing of a major party. I'm not a political insider. I, am, I have chosen to run as an independent candidate without party affiliation to take my message directly to the voters. The, uh, uh, my, my approach to this um, uh, race is, is that it's not a race. I regard myself to be applying for a position, and I'm asking each and every voter to hire me to do the job if they think that I'm the right person with the right qualifications to do the job. Because I'm running as an independent, I'd like to qualify that. I have nothing against the party system. The party system is something that has made this country great. <coughs> I've opened a big tent, and I'd like to welcome everybody in. The, um, I, I would like everyone, regardless of party affiliation, to feel comfortable voting for me based on who I am and what I've done. A quick word about my background that's relevant to this position. I have a BA and MBA from the University of Massachusetts. I have a law degree. I'm a lawyer. I'm a member of the Mass Bar. I happen to think that being a lawyer will feature prominently in the ability of the next Register of Deeds to do this job. This is an increasingly complicated world, and, it, and, and a properly experienced person is needed for this position. In addition, I'd like to point out that my eight years in government as a as uh, Northampton City Treasurer has given me uh, the realization and the insight of the importance of customer service, and I am able, I am able to work effectively to get the job done. Thanks. So I'm going to turn it over to our media representatives to uh, ask the panelists questions. And as I, um, as I laid out in the in the rules before of the forum, um, they will ask a question and the candidates will each have two minutes to respond to the same question. And so I'm going to suggest that we sort of uh, alternate the order. So we'll start with Tim to field the first question and then we'll go in the same order in which you gave your opening statements and, and then uh, Mary will take the next question first and so on, if that makes sense. That makes sense. I will, I will figure out who's going by. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, as Register of Deeds, what steps would each of you take to deter foreclosures resulting from so-called robo-signings? Um, okay. <clears throat> Just briefly, robo-signing, a lot of people have heard it. Um, when a, a lender is foreclosing on a property, they have to submit certain documents, first to the court, then to the Registry of Deeds to record. Along with those documents, they have to put an affidavit that says all these documents are true and accurate based on their personal knowledge. <clears throat> Big banks, such as Wells Fargo, um, other large investment firms, they hire what they call a robo-signer, somebody just to sit there and sign this affidavit one after another after another without ever really looking at those documents. So the issue now is whether that's legal. Um, to deter it, as part of my, what I want to do about making the registry more visible and accessible, is get information out to people that might be victims of, of a so-called robo-signed document and let them know that there are resources. A lot of people won't challenge a, a foreclosure because they don't have the funds. There's entities out there that'll do it, uh, provide legal services for free. Um, so as far as, it, that's to get it from the consumer angle. As far as from the legal aspect, that's going to have to be decided by the courts and then the legislature and the, well, the attorney, attorney general will issue the, the final say on what's recorded and what's not. But as a register, it's more of just getting the people aware of what their rights are in pushing it that way. And of course, I'd work closely with the courts or any other um, judicial system entity that, that would um, require us to do so. Mary, it's my turn. Well, the robo-signed documents uh, have, uh, are fairly known, the, the list of robo-signers. The registry maintains a list of these robo-signers, and if a document were presented, uh, as register, I would advise my staff and any customers coming in that it is not the job of the registry to reject robo-signed documents. I would, if I saw signatures that were on the list, I would advise those clients to go back to their attorney and possibly seek ad uh, additional signatures. Uh, if a document meets the deed indexing standards, the registry is duty bound to accept those documents. It is not the job of the register to question the underlying title of a document. After all, who am I as register to be an expert in forgeries? It's, I can't determine whether that signature is actually the signature of the, the true signature or if it is, if it is a robo-signed document. That is the job of the Attorney General. The Attorney General just today announced her program, it was in Mass Live today, uh, called Home Corps, and it's a program that supports mortgage borrowers and gives them legal assistance and help with loan modification. If you want to stop foreclosures, you should run for Attorney General. You should not be running for Registry of Deeds. You are running in the wrong race. So I would help, I would help people, victims of foreclosure, and advise them on other community agencies. And I would certainly provide the resources to prevent foreclosure. But it is not the job of the register to reject robo-signed documents. George? Well, the, um, the robo-signing issue is an offshoot of the MERS issue. That's M-E-R-S, uh, Mortgage Electronic Recording System. Uh, it's a highly technical area. And uh, ultimately what comes down is uh, the ability of Wall Street at this time to bypass uh, public recording systems for their own recording system that they've created. And it, basically this is an offshoot of corporate greed. I would see the role of Register of Deeds uh, in this community as being a champion of the cause uh, of property owners in protecting their rights. Um, so. Um, 
the way that I see that something like that would be done, and I, I agree with Mary that uh, the role, you know, the, the, to to accept the deeds in proper format uh, is all that the registry of deeds can do. I remember reading an article that the um, Empire State Building was uh, 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 transferred by a fraudulent transaction, and it was how bad can the recording system in New York be? Well, that's not the job to validate uh, the fraudulent uh, nature of any particular transaction in any registry of deeds in any jurisdiction throughout the Commonwealth. So t to go forward, the uh, registers of deeds uh, in the Commonwealth meet on a regular basis, and they feed information, those that report to Bill Galvin, Secretary of State. Uh, in that type of exchange, I would be advocating uh, changes uh, that would be possible in the law. The settlement of mirrors in this offshoot RoboCop signing is something that needs to be settled with the legislature or with the courts, but they're struggling with it because it is such a, a complicated issue. Uh, uh, also, I would uh, care to be a champion uh, going forward with Martha Coakley, the Attorney General. I've witnessed, I witnessed the development of this mirror's uh, debacle firsthand uh, in the early 1990s. I know it. I can, I can champion this cause at the local, state, and national level. Bonnie? Okay. Well, as of August 3rd, 2012, the governor signed House Bill 4323, an act preventing the unlawful and unnecessary foreclosure. This law prohibits robo-signing. As of this moment, any register cannot allow a robo-signed document into the registry of deeds. And it violates our present law, Mass General Laws uh, 36, Section 12A, which states a register may refuse to accept a document for recording if it cannot be properly duplicated. If I duplicate a robo-signed document, I'm committing fraud. I'm allowing fraud on the courts. I cannot accept robo-signed documents. Register O'Brien <laughs> has prepared a three-page list of known robo-signers that he circulates and puts on his webpage. These have all been certified by a forensic um, handwriting expert. These are available to each and every register throughout the country. Since my article prepared that was appeared in the Valley Advocate in March, homeowners now call me and ask me to review their documents for robo-signed signatures. I am sought out because I'm an advocate and I want to protect our homes and our families and communities. Thank you. question? Sure. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot about transparency and accessibility during this campaign. In fact, they've become buzzwords. Um, nobody will disagree that that's important. But what I want is bullet points. What are the specific elements of your action plan to make the registry more accessible and meaningful and transparent to its users? This question goes to Mary first. Uh, well, the first uh, the first bullet point is electronic filing. Uh, I would begin implementation of that to make the registry more accessible, efficient, and transparent. Uh, electronic filing has been around for around five years. Not all of the registries currently have it. Uh, Middlesex North has had it the longest, and to them it has made a difference of up to 30 to 35 percent of their efficiency is made up with electronic filing. Uh, as the economy puts the squeeze on staffing and we lose uh, staff to attrition, we will not have the we will not have the staff to maintain the current levels of customer service. Electronic filing will help maintain those levels of efficiency. Is there more? That's it, electronic filing? Oh, the other things that would help with accessibility and transparency are uh, there's tote boards that are available at other registries that when you go in to file your deeds, uh, you have already signed about an inch thick of documents at your closing. But the tote board, when the attorney goes in to file it, would keep track of any last minute liens that may have been slapped on, the rec on your records. 
uh, that would help maintain uh, transparency and, and efficiency. The other, do I have time? There's many other things, including management of storage of documents, uh, making sure that the, the old maps of the county roads are made available online and digitized. George? The, the biggest uh, thing that I see that features prominently in establishing transparency and accessibility uh, to the Registry of Deeds, in my mind, to a great extent, has already occurred, and that's that so many of our records are already on electronic files and searchable through mass land records. I know as a city treasurer, when I'm researching tax matters uh, regarding delinquent taxes, I find it so much easier just to access that over the Internet, which any of you can do. Uh, that's a tremendous amount of transparency. Uh, in the process. Uh, in addition, uh, my perspective would be, uh, to a great extent, um, the users of the Registry of Deeds are primarily um, practicing attorneys, practicing attorneys working with land transactions. Uh, for those who don't know, and I'm somewhat staggered by this number, there are about 30,000 30, recordings each year in the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds. That's a lot of business for seven or eight people to take care of. Um, I remain fascinated, of course, by uh, what gets done uh, at the Registry of Deeds. Uh, in terms of transparency, any, anybody can go in uh, and, and pull out books uh, by book and page number uh, indicating land transactions going back. The uh, first um, official record in our Registry of Deeds goes back to the 1670s. We have proprietary records uh, filed as well that go back to the 1650s. Those are gorgeous documents to go see. Uh, I, I will just point out as an aside, uh, I enjoy everything about real estate, real estate transactions. That's the reason I'm pursuing uh, this uh, particular position. Uh, the, I'll, I'll also uh, finish up with saying that uh, in terms of accessibility, I would like to engage in educational outreach to homeowners so they understand um, uh, services that, that are available. Uh, for example, if their attorney would happen to overlook the homestead ex exemption, uh, those types of open houses would enable uh, the public to be informed. Thank you. Bonnie? Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we've heard a lot about transparency and accessibility. Uh, nobody will disagree with that, but I want bullet points. Uh, what are the specific elements of your action plan? to make the registry more accessible, meaningful, and transparent to its users? Um, I, I teach a lot of classes on exactly how to use the land records for genealogical research. And in my recent classes that I've taught, one issue keeps coming up. We cannot access our older documents. And a lot of people want them moved so that we have all our documents under one roof. And right now, these records are stored in the basement next to lockup in Hamden County. It's not a very comfortable place to be to research our land records. We have land records that go back to the early 1600s. And I would like to partner with Register Ash to get these documents duplicated and moved to Hampshire County so that our historians can have access to these documents. And I, people in Hampshire County need to dictate the needs at the Registry of Deeds because they're, they're public records, and I want to keep them accessible to everyone. Thank you. Tim. Thank you. <clears throat> um, well, I think I might have mentioned some of this in my opening, uh, making the registry more accessible. Um, a couple of ways. One, like I said, actually getting out uh, in meeting people, holding talks on issues like the homestead. Um, another thing, again, having opening it up to schools, letting schools know they can bring the kids through, um, or college students, or people interested in, in law. Um, and I think currently there, there, there's a website that you can go and look at your land records. You know, it, it's, it's functional. Um, the, ha the Hampshire County Probate Court, they have a fantastic website. It's got forms, it's got questions and answers, it's got how to. Um, I think the registry needs something like that. Uh, a one-stop shop, you can go, you can get um, frequently asked questions, you can get state-approved forms to fill out. Uh, 
make it easy to navigate. The, the state site's kind of difficult to get to. Um, also, put links of, of resources available, such as like I discussed with the um, with the robo signing. If you think you've been a victim, um, also alert the public of potential scams. There's there's scams where companies will say they can get you a deed for a hundred dollars, and you can go to the registry and get it for a dollar. Um, or most recently, after a closing, somebody will call posing as a lender and say that they represent such and such a bank, give us your personal info because we have more money for you. Um, these are the kinds of things that I think if, if there's one central location, put it all there for the people to use. And I think that's, uh, well, it's going to be a priority, but I think it it's, would be a great tool. Uh, what do each of you think are the merits of continuing to have the Register of Deeds be an elected rather than an appointed position? This goes to George first. Well, I'm not sure that I see one. Uh, the, the obvious one, uh, you know, the, the, the merit of having this an elected um, position um, is that it uh, the the power of who is in office or who serves in that role is in the hands uh, of the voters uh, as a democratic process. So that's the positive in it. Uh, however, um, I see more uh, detriment uh, to this being an elected uh, position. Uh, in my mind, this should be an appointed position because so much of what gets done is technical and requires a. a uh, technical proficiency and uh, a high level of experience uh, to uh, execute it properly. Uh, I'll, I'll note that as uh, Northampton City Treasurer, I first came into an elected position and, and served as an elected official for four years uh, in my eight-year term. The last four years has been as an appointed, so I, I can talk from both experiences. Um, it really does, uh, in, in, you know, in terms of the uh, uh, ability uh, to get things done uh, and uh, the work effort uh, uh, that one um, uh, utilizes, whether elected or um, appointed, you know, it depends on the p particular person. I always strive to do the best job possible under any circumstance. Um, so um, in, in, the long, in the long run, um, I think uh, this position actually would be uh, uh, quite well suited to be an appointed position. Like it's it's one of those questions I keep going back and forth on. I can also see the pros pros and the the cons and base and it's back in our history when we were under a county government and our register was more involved in. Um, decisions in making and budgeting for the county. Our excise tax that we collected at the Registry of Deeds uh, funded our local jail. And so our money went right back into our community. Now our money goes into the general fund for, for the state. But I keep going back to the same old thing. You know, these are our public land records and for them to remain public we need a public official to oversee our land records. And the people need to choose this person. And that's why I think it should continue to be an elected position. Um, I think in theory, an election, you, you get the, the best suited person for that job. Um, doesn't always work. Um, I'm gonna steal a line from the Berkshire uh, registrar candidate and he said the only thing political about this job is getting it. Um, in other words, it's it's not a policy making position. Um, it's more of um, it's a it's an over you're overseeing land transfers. You're, you're managing a staff. You're making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. You're making sure the documents are coming in properly. Is that a position that necessarily the public is, is the right people to be, uh, you know, hiring you? Um, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult question. Um, but I think, like Bonnie said, I, I think it still needs to remain an elected position, but I think people really need to, before they make a decision, really look at each candidate. Mary. 
The fact that the registrar's job is elected goes back to the founding of the county 350 years ago. The reason it was an elected position is that they wanted the register to be a representative of the people. They wanted someone who knew the land and the land records. They wanted to know someone who knew the property owners. I think that's still true today. The records need to be where the land lies. If appointed, then you're not accountable to the people of Hampshire County. You're you, are, you are accountable to the person that appoints you. I work on the Finance Committee, and I have a sense of the relationship between Boston and the municipalities. If Boston decides to close up the registry and centralize the records back in Boston, if you're appointed, you must say, OK, I'll help you do that. But if you're elected, you can look at the needs of the people of Hampshire County and decide that that may not be the best to meet those needs. Recently, there was a commission formed by legislation introduced by Senator Stan Rosenberg. That commission is going to study the efficacy of the registries going forward. It will be a year-long commission that will study what the registry will do in the future. I. I don't know if it will remain appointed or elected, but I think it's important in the job to make sure that the needs of the residents of Hampshire County are met, whether you are elected or appointed. One more question from the panel. Sure. Um, I'd like to know what can go wrong on the job. Uh, <laughs> Uh, could you name a few of the biggest mistakes a register could make on the job? And is there an example of a register of deeds in the Commonwealth who has, has in some significant way failed? Bonnie, this goes to you first. <laughs> well, the register's job is to oversee the indexing and the recording process of documents. Anytime a title examiner finds a mistake, I, I think the, the, the register is not doing their job. They're there to make ensure the integrity of our documents. Each and every week, I'm in one registry from here to you know, Worcester, Fitchburg, and up into the Berkshires. I regularly find documents that are inde indexed incorrectly. I recently found last year somebody's deed has been lost for over five years. Thankfully, he never mortgaged his property in that time. But you know, you had to wonder, did he own the property? Because of my background, I can always find the document. But now that we are on the, we have an online system, we have title searches being done in India and Pakistan, and they're reporting to their attorneys that these properties are not owned by the people who want the mortgages. So I think any time that a document is misindexed, a name is misspelled, the register's not doing their job because it's their job to make sure that everything is accurate, preserve the integrity of our documents. Tim. Oh, I'm not <coughs> um, I, I tend to agree with Bonnie. Um, and I'll just to give you two quick examples. Uh, this, these, this did not happen in the Hampshire registry, but um, a colleague of mine, he submitted a document for recording. It was a, a lien. And the notary who stamped it didn't print her name. She just stamped it with an ink stamp. Well, that register said that was not proper, which it, in my opinion, it, it, was, it was fine. So what they did was they mailed the lien back to my colleague. By the time he got it, the statute had run for the time period to put that lien on. So was that catastrophic? No, but now his client is out of a, a remedy. He can still sue him, but now he's got to try to chase him for the money. Um, so that was a bad example. A good example was a different colleague. He had a client who lent his friend money and said, if you ever sell your house, you can pay me back. Well, 35 years later, the friend passes away kids say, okay, we're going to sell the house. Problem is, my, my colleague's client never recorded the mortgage. So he brings it down to the registry and says, I'd like to record this. Now the person says, it's too old. You can't. Luckily, the register there said, no, it's a perfectly acceptable document payable on the sale of the house. 
So they recorded the mortgage. The kids weren't happy because now they had to pay the, the friend back, but that's an example where having somebody there who knows, knows the system was, was a good ending. Mary? Uh, uh, one of the biggest mistakes that was made most recently is uh, one of the registers uh, out near Boston was caught on tape spending all of his time in his law office and not in the registry. So one of the biggest mistakes one can make is uh, spending too much time on your business on the side and not the full-time job of the register. Uh, another mistake is to give legal advice. The Register of Deeds is not allowed to give legal advice uh, or search titles. The, pro the statute prohibits a register from searching titles. The Registry of Deeds is really like a library. The documents are cataloged there and available for public access. But like the librarian, you would never edit the work, check the spelling. You don't check the work of the, that's brought in. You simply provide for their public use and access. Uh, when I was in Human Resources, I, uh, I used to advise people of their benefits. Section 125 plans are dependent care and health care reimbursement plans. That's part of the tax code and it gets very technical. I could tell any employee all about their benefits, but I would not be allowed to give them legal advice or accounting advice. They should seek the advice of experts in that field. And I would say the same is true for the register, to be sure that you don't make a mistake and, and direct customers to the appropriate resources. George. Okay, I see that there's two types of things that can go wrong in general. Uh, one would be the technical uh, recordings. Are they properly uh, recorded, uh, properly filed? Um, that type of thing uh, I would see as uh, the responsibility of a tra properly trained and managed staff. Um, in my mind, uh, you know, that's a, a work product process, uh, a quality control thing. Uh, and um, and uh, so I think, you know, that's one level of things that can go wrong. Uh, I don't necessarily see that um, uh, there's particularly um, you know, difficult situations that cannot be unwound because of the uh, procedures uh, that have been in place for years. Uh, the, uh, on the other side of the coin, uh, at, at the more global uh, man managerial uh, level of what can go wrong, uh, one thing that comes to my mind would be skimming uh, of funds by an employee. Uh, and that would be something that uh, would have to be watched, of course. Thanks. So we are moving into the audience question portion forum. And uh, just a reminder, these are one minute answers. And er the candidates are going to answer every candidate answers every question, right? So we'll continue with our order. So this uh, first question is going to go to Tim first, and we'll continue to follow the order. Um, so the question is, what are the qualifications for the job register of deeds? That is, what are the necessary criteria? I'm not asking what your qualifications are, but what qualifications are required for the job? <laughs> what would a job description say? Wow. So I can't use this to promote myself. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the register of deeds. You need a couple of things. One, you need somebody who has experience with the registry, obviously. You need somebody who knows the system. You need somebody, God bless Pat Plaza. She's been there for a long time and she knows the system inside and out. If she were to leave, the next register is gonna have to know the system to take it over as a seamless transition. Um, so you need somebody who knows the system, you need somebody who knows the have a, a background in real estate law or in conveyancing who knows what, docu what to look for in documents. Um, you need somebody who can be a leader, who can motivate their staff, get them through things like electronic recording, and um, uh, 
right. um, Mary is next. Uh, I think the job description of the register is someone who has management experience, someone who can uh, take into account strategic planning, how you provide the resources for your staff to provide uh, resources in budgets for changes in technology, for public education, for making sure your staff is compensated, that you take into account what is going to be the future of the registry. Things like storage needs of documents, the books of the grantee and grantor indexes are no longer going to be printed. Those will need to be available for uh, people who are not as familiar with the, the electronic indices. But how long will you keep them on the shelf? There will be pressure going down the road to decrease costs. That includes things like office space. How are you going to manage the efficiency of the office? Uh, those are the considerations I think that the manager, that the register needs to be. They need to be able. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a minute. Yeah. George? Okay. Well, I'll j I will just happen to point out uh, as an elected position, there are no requirements, uh, and that may be problematic to it. On the other hand, there are really no requirements to be President of the United States. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be um, qualifications for this position. If I was writing. Um, a job uh, description uh, pointing out the particular uh, uh, requirements for this position, I would include uh, should have a bachelor's degree, should have a law degree, uh, should have good organizational skills, should have long-term strategic thinking skills, uh, should have uh, uh, experience um, uh, creating policies, uh, should have experience uh, formulating um, operating procedures. Uh, should have experience um, in um, pros process improvement. Uh, I'd also note uh, somebody uh, to qualify for this position should have, I would say, five to seven years of relevant managerial experience. Honey? <laughs> well, it's being in the registry each and every day. Customer service is the main goal the register. They have to be able to stand at the counter and tell that attorney, no, it's not an acceptable document. <laughs> and the other time, there's somebody that's coming in and saying, my husband just died. How do I get the deed in my name? You've got to be able to walk people through the process, either it be the attorney and say, no, you didn't put that information correctly in the deed, I need a consideration, I need a notary date, or to that woman that says, I just lost my husband, you need to be able to direct her to the right office and with information that she feels comforted with. Most important, not only do you need to know what the customers need, but you need to know how the users use the registry so that you can make decisions on how to budget the limited resources of this office. All right, so the next question goes to Mary first, um, and it says this. The administrative slash record keeping aspects of the office appear fairly straightforward. Please elaborate on what you see as the statewide behind the scenes duties of the office and how you are best suited to represent Hampshire County in those duties. Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, being on the finance committee, I think I have a good understanding of the relationship between Boston and municipalities. Uh, what that means is uh, everything that happens in the registry is actually governed by statute. Uh, chapter 36 of Mass General Law is what, what is how the register operates. If you would like to change things in the registry, you need to work with the legislators to implement that change. Uh, for instance, storage of the documents currently is mandated to be backed up on microfilm. Is that the best way to store the documents? I'm not so sure. I would advocate that there's probably uh, much better means of, of backup. I think that thing, working with the Attorney General to stop the foreclosure crisis, working with the Secretary of the Commonwealth, who, who under whose auspices the the registry operates to make sure that we have budget for technology. 
uh, George. Could, could you restate that question? It was a little bit long. So the administrative slash record keeping aspects of the office appear fairly straightforward. Please elaborate on what you see as the statewide behind the scenes duties of the office and how you are best suited to represent Hampshire County in those duties. Okay, well in answering that I'll point out that um, a number, uh, I, I believe it's the majority of um, registries of deeds are state positions reporting into the Secretary of State. Uh, then there are other counties that have registers of deeds reporting directly into that county. Uh, in, in that we're reporting into the Secretary of State, um, I would think it would, I, I believe it would, is very important to be involved in the regular register of uh, deeds um, meetings, being able to uh, uh, send information up to Bill Galvin so that he can make uh, very good decisions. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in the, in the event of you know the state attorney general Mar uh, Martha Coakley working in this area, I'd be uh, very comfortable championing in the the cause of uh, uh, homeowners' rights with her. Bonnie. Well, in 1999, we lost our we moved from a county system, and you know as you George stated this. Registry of Deeds is now under the Secretary of State's office. The whole goal for moving into a statewide system is continuity throughout the whole state, throughout the whole Registry of Deeds. It still has not been achieved. We have too many different registers who, yes, some of them report to the Secretary of State, some report to the county. And we can't move forward with any of that until we get everybody on the same page. And even some, we're, we talk about the registries each having their unique personalities, and that is still very true in all the counties. So unless we have continuity throughout the whole state, um, record keeping will be difficult to move forward, but the registers need to start working together as a group and realize that they're under the um, office of the Secretary of State's office. Tim. Um, well, in my line of work, I'm duty-bound to zealously advocate for my clients. Um, and I, I would bring that same advocacy to, to the citizens of Hampshire County. And I think one of the biggest things is the budget. It's, it's a fact of life. Um, so we need somebody who's going to be able to to really fight for every penny that the, that the registry is going to need to, to maintain a level of service that the citizens require. Um, and I th also think, piggybacking on what George said, the flow of information to the state, that's also critical um, to explain why we might need something or to let them know that this may or may not be working. I think the registry, uh, the register also has to work with the legislatures, be able to if something is just not working, they need to be able to explain to the to the state why it's not. And again, working with the attorney general with issues such as foreclosure, uh, potential robo signing, etc. So I think those are the the key factors. All right. Here's the next question. Um, so this first it goes to George first. Um, what percentage of the register's job is spent overseeing personnel budgeting? conducting strategic planning and activism, respectively. Don't need to repeat that. Yeah. So yeah. personnel. That, that, that in percentage. Yeah, what a percentage? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can answer this very quickly, right? Yeah. Um, personnel, <laughs> budgeting, conducting strategic planning, and activism. I would, I would think the largest percent would be the strategic planning, uh, perhaps in the 60 to 70 percent range. I think that's the most important function of the uh, register of deeds to keep uh, the registry of deeds on track. Uh, following next uh, would be uh, activism, uh, and that would, you know, that would vary uh, uh, on a, you know, on a uh, circumstances basis. But I would see that say. You know, if we said one was 60 percent, the other is, uh, that would be uh, 15 percent, uh, and following uh, would be uh, personnel uh, with another 15 percent, and if my math is good, 10 percent for budgeting. Bonnie. 
Fortunately, with the Registry of Deeds, you have no way of predicting how many documents are going to come in to the registry each and every day. Some days they only record 30, some days it's 120. But you always have to have staff there because you never know when an attorney is coming through the door to record a document. All documents are time sensitive. You have to make sure everything gets on in time for the funding to, to happen. So personnel is, is really knowing that you have staff there to cover is one of the most important things. And I would put that as going over probably 40%. It's not that the staff needs managing. It's an excellent staff, very professional and knowledgeable. Budgeting would probably take, it's only a short period of the year and strategic planning and activism. I see activism as 30% I'm not very good at math, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I know my deeds, not my math. Um, okay, uh, Tim. Um, I think strategic planning uh, would would be a considerable amount of uh, the, of the time. Um, you know, constantly making sure, thinking of ways to improve the registry, improve the efficiency, improve the customer service. Um, you know, I think that's one of the registrar's duties. Um, activism, I think, is extremely important as well. It, making information accessible to the public, um, especially issues that really affect people's lives, like the foreclosure crisis, um, scams, things that can that can really do more harm than good. And I think the register, while we can't necessarily make the policy, but we can we can urge others to to adopt or change policies. Uh, so we'll say 40-40, 10-10 for personnel and budgeting. And Mary. Well, surveyors, lawyers, title examiners are all customers of the registry, just like you and me. You may go to Stop and Shop every day and know where everything in the store is, but that doesn't mean you know how to manage the store. My experience is in management. And the reality of the question you're asking is that you need to do each of those things 100% of the time. And having been a personnel manager, I know that that op occupies most of your time. Because there's all kinds of issues related to staffing, customer service uh, that come up. So in planning purposes, I would plan that that be 30%. Budgeting is actually, as far as I'm concerned, part of personnel management. That would be 20. Strategic plan planning, I would say 30. And activism, 20. The registers all got together and that asked for the banking contracts to be removed from Bank of America. And I would include that as part of the activism. All right. And the last question from the audience is uh, goes to Bonnie first. Will you actively support President Obama and Elizabeth Warren in November? Please explain <laughs> why. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I'm honored to say that at Obama's inauguration, I, have, I had three generations of my family present in the audience of his inauguration. It was my father-in-law, who is a disabled vet sitting in his wheelchair with, his hu with my husband pushing him into the handicapped position. And there behind it was my son, all in attendance. You have to know that my father-in-law is one generation removed from slavery. That was a very important moment in our family. As for Elizabeth Warren, it's nice to have somebody in my own age group running for office. And I identify with her and her consumerism and taking action for the middle class. Yes, I'm voting for Bell. Uh, Tim is next. Oh, good. Um. <laughs> I tend to agree with Bonnie. Um, I, I would support both. Um, I do think 
um, especially uh, with Elizabeth Warren, her, her approach to protecting the middle class, consumerism, I think, is really important. And I think, not to get too political, but I think we're seeing a bigger and bigger divide between the haves and the haves nots. And, and it's just, I don't know the answer. I, I want to be the Register of Deeds, not a senator, but um, I think something needs to be, needs to be done. Um, and I think the way it's going, we're, we're on the right track. So I'd like to see that continue. And that's what I'd be supporting. Mary? Absolutely. Part of my decision to run for Register of Deeds was difficult because it meant that I could not work for Obama or Elizabeth Warren. I attended the Democratic National Convention in 2008 as a volunteer. Not everybody has that as their lifelong dream, but that was mine. I watched every convention, Republican and Democrat, since I could remember with my mother. So I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't gone to that convention and been inspired to get more involved than I already had been. As a mother, I know the importance of protecting my family. As a Democrat, I see the importance of elected offices to protect all of our families. George. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that I see the relevance of that question in this forum. Um, and I, I uh, care to uh, uh, retain my privacy and what my personal decisions are. I think the uh, voting, the uh, ability to vote, the freedom of voting uh, in this country is very valuable and is not to be compromised. I come from a family of uh, parents who were independent their entire voting career, and they never told me who they voted for. So I come from that background of privacy. Uh, and as an independent for 32 of my 40 voting years, um, I guess you'll just have to guess. <laughs> All right, so it's time for closing statements. Each candidate has two minutes, and we start with Bonnie. Two minutes or one minute? We oh, sorry, one minute. I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me again. One minute. <laughs> Is the register just an administrator? Why do I ask this? question as we give our closing remarks. I'm asking this because I want you to know the total budget for this office is less than $500,000 per year. That 85% of this budget is controlled by the Secretary of State's office for the salaries and the benefits of the employees, including the register. This office exists on an operating budget less than $60,000 a year. To the register, knows how to function, sorry, to administer this amount of money. It's important that the off register knows how this office functions and to be able to allocate these limited resources to effectively operate this office that has a mandate to protect and preserve the ownership documents to your home, to ensure the integrity of our land record system and to protect your home. You need to elect a register who can oversee the important task of recording and indexing the documents into the public land registration system. Thank you. Tim. Um, I'd just like to close with just, <coughs> this isn't a, an appointed position like we discussed. Um, it's an elected position and we're hired by, by you, the voters. Um, and I would just ask you before you make a decision, um, really just look at all the qualifications of each candidate who you think, after making an informed decision, is, is best suited, best skill set. Um, I believe that you'd find me to be that candidate. So I'd ask you for your vote on September 6th. Thank you. The Registry of Deeds exists to protect the integrity of the land record system and all records related to property. The value of these records is beyond their historic nature, though that is important. It is the entire basis for the clear and orderly transfer of property. Managing and maintaining that order is the job of the Registry. It would be disingenuous for a candidate to promise to stop foreclosures as Register. The job is to manage and secure the land records, 
to manage the staff and the resources to provide public access, to manage the budget to compensate employees and upgrade technology, and to manage the implementation of electronic fields, of electronic filing, including mapping all of the fields. I have the breadth of knowledge and management to manage the registry. I am proud to have the endorsements of Congressman John Olver, Senator Stan Rosenberg, District Attorney Dave Sullivan, and Mary Ann Donahue, the former Register of Deeds. They all agree I have the skills and experience for this job. Thanks to our candidates. Oh, sorry, George. Uh, Zimmerman is always last. Sorry, sorry. For my closing remarks, I, I'd like to say that I very much appreciated have the, uh, having the opportunity to present uh, my message uh, to all of you this evening. I look forward to being invited to other forums like this in the future. Uh, I am the only candidate at this point in time who can say that I will be on the ballot uh, on November 6th. <laughs> um, I'm very interested about uh, the Registry of Deeds and all things related to real estate. And uh, I would uh, certainly uh, enjoy the opportunity to talk to individuals or groups uh, about uh, this subject. I can talk for minutes, hours, or days, as you would like. Uh, to learn more about my background, please visit ZimmermanForDeeds.org. Uh, uh, and in closing, uh, and as a final sign-off, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I'd like to thank the other other candidates to, for making this a positive and informative race. And I'd like to thank the sponsors for making this evening possible. Thank you. So, thanks to the four candidates. Thank you for keeping thank me in you. line. I am learning a lot doing this. I've never done this before. Um, it shows. Um, so Act 2 is going to be a chance for me to do a little better moderating with the Governor's Council Forum. And uh, there will be new index cards to take audience questions. But for now, we're going to take a two-minute break. So we'll be right back with Act 2. Uh, so, welcome to part two. This is the Governor's Council Forum. And I'm happy to introduce the three candidates for Governor's Council. Um, first is on the left is Jerry Roy. He is a small business owner and real estate broker. He's currently Chicopee City Councilor. He grew up in South Hadley and he is currently a resident of Chicopee. And to his left is Michael Albano who was mayor of Springfield, Massachusetts for four consecutive terms of office. During his tenure as mayor in 2001, Mike became the lead elected official in support of marriage equality in the civil suit against the Attorney General and Secretary of State. Also during his time as mayor, Mike worked with Senator Kennedy to bring health care clinics to Springfield and the Clinton White House to bring in additional community police officers. And to his left is Kevin Sullivan, Kevin was born and raised in Westfield, where he currently resides with his wife and two children. Kevin has been practicing law in Western Massachusetts for the past 21 years. And currently, Kevin is the vice chairman of the Westfield School Committee. So welcome. And so the format is going to be very similar to the last forum. It's going to start with two minute opening statements. And speaking order is Albano Roy Sullivan. As I understand, it was randomly chosen. They drew random numbers, I think. Um, and after that, there will be questions from our media representatives, Stan Moulton and Mary Cerez. And after that, there will be questions from the audience that will be given a, there's sort of a two minute response time, sorry for questions from the media, then one minute response time for audience questions collected by index cards. So be writing your questions that you want to ask the candidates. And then we will have closing statements at the end, which will be one minute in length. So with that. Well, thank you very much. And good evening to everyone. And thank you for having me here at this forum with my, my colleagues, both seeking the office of governor's council from the 8th district. My name is Michael Albano. I'm the former mayor of Springfield, Massachusetts. During my tenure uh, in public life, I've had a chance not only to serve as mayor, member of the Springfield uh, School Committee, member of the Springfield City Council, City Council President, acting mayor. Uh, perhaps more important relative to this position is the fact that I served as an advisor to three governors and during the course and tenure of my terms as mayor worked for four other ones. 
Uh, I'm seeking this uh, position because if you understand the role of the Governor's Council in confirming nominees by the Governor, and you understand, and I know you do, public policy, you have a real opportunity here to shape the form of public policy in the form of these nominees and these appointments. What do I mean by that? I'm a Kennedy Democrat. I'm a Kennedy liberal. I don't want to go back in time relative to marriage equality. We fought too hard to get where we are today. And that vote only passed the Supreme Judicial Court by one vote. So the confirmation of a Supreme Court justice in this state can make a difference re relative to marriage equality. I don't want to go back relative to affirmative action. I'm a strong believer in affirmative action. As mayor, we created the most diverse workforce in the history of the city, including the first woman chief of police. And I put more people of color on boards and commissions into public policy making positions to influence public policy. So relative to affirmative action, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back relative to a woman's right to choose. I don't want to go back relative to the death penalty. So this is an important position relative to judicial appointments and non-judicial appointments, and that's why I'm seeking the seat, and I believe my experience and background is well suited for this job. Thanks. Jerry. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming and taking an interest in, in learning about candidates. A lot of people just don't take the time to be informed. My name is Jerry Roy. I'm a real estate broker in Chicopee. I grew up in South Hadley, uh, up near Mount Holyoke College. And uh, when I was small, about 10 years old, my father uh, ended up getting a, uh, a flu vaccine, which disabled him shortly thereafter. And it really gave, made me critical of, of government, especially when, when corporations are involved. Um, it's <sighs> There's, there's too much stuff going on in government now with, with the lobbyists and running the, corporate, uh, running the uh, um, political scene, with uh, you know, Goldman Sachs and, the, and uh, all of that, running the, the Wall Street, running the, the uh, Treasury um, and the Federal Reserve. There's just, there's just too much incestuous relationships with, with government. It, it just never seems to work out well. And I think that some of the, you know, with my, my colleagues, their political connections uh, go back decades, their family connections go back decades. I think that that's a definite influence in their point of view, and it's going to be something that with, you know, it's only a two-year appointment uh, or, or um, two-year uh, term, but at the same time, their appointments can last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. So it's something that uh, to think about what is their, you know, what is their um, position, um, you know, as far as influence, outside influence. And I have no, I have nobody that, that uh, I owe anything to. And I, I think that makes me a lot different than a lot of other, uh, the other candidates. Thank you. Kevin. Thank you. And uh, thank you again for setting up this forum. Coming to JFK is a great opportunity for the three of us. My name's Kevin Sullivan. I was born and raised and still reside in Westfield. Wednesday night I'll celebrate my 20th anniversary with my wife, Laura. I have two teenage kids presently at Westfield High School. I am the vice chair of the Westfield School Committee and have served on that board for the last five years. I do have quite a few connections with Northampton as well. My father was born and raised on Maynard Road. My uncle, Bill Miller was a trustee at Childs Park and I worked many a summer over with him and the former school, D.A. Sullivan School, was named after my great-grandfather. So the city of Holmes has always been good to the Sullivan family. I'm a lifelong Democrat. I'm very proud of those traditions and I will continue to fight for those traditions as we move forward. In 1991, I earned my Juris Doctorate degree at Albany Law School and that what makes me different from my opponents. I sat and passed both the Massachusetts and the New York State Bar Exam, and for the last 21 years, I've been practicing in the courts of Western Massachusetts throughout the 96 cities and towns of the 8th District. I understand the community aspect of these courts, and that's key, because the primary job of the Governor's Council is to approve or reject the Governor's appointments for judicial nominations. I understand what it takes to run those jobs. The, um, the key to this whole position is accountability, integrity, and competence. That's how I've run my law practice for the past 21 years. That's how we'll run the job of the Governor's Council. Tom Merrigan, the present Governor's Council, had a great conversation with me several months ago when I decided to run, and his first comment was, the job is defending the turf of Western Massachusetts, making sure the qualified people of Western Massachusetts get appointed to these judicial positions, make sure they understand the community, make sure 
that they retain that integrity and accountability, and I promise to do so. All right, thanks. I'm going to turn it over to our panel. Okay. Uh, the Governor's Council has been described as more of a boxing ring than a governmental body, riddled with personality conflicts, punitive measures, and inappropriate questioning of nominees. What's going on and what's the solution? So in answering, I, I don't know if I said this before, but I'd like to start with Jerry and then go through the order that you've been going through, but change who starts first. So this time, start with Jerry. Okay. I think, I think like any, any board, you're going to have problems with people getting along. Um, as far as the questioning and that, you know, I, I, if I had examples, I, I could tell, make a comment on it. But um, I know even uh, in Chicopee, as, as, you know, as, as um, organized kind of in the city government as we are, uh, we had we had a, a good split. Um, I'm I'm new in there this this year in uh, January. I was sworn in, and we had a, we had a, a very divisive, uh, uh, you know, two different two different fashions that uh, were against each other. And I think pe people quickly learned that I don't play politics. I simply look at what the issue is and uh, decide based on its merits. Is it good for the city? Is it good? Is it not? And uh, it, you know, it's easy if you do it that way. You don't you don't lose sleep at night about anything. Kevin is next. Yes. The only time you read about the Governor's Council in the past few years is when something goes, goes astray. It's, a, it's been a dysfunctional board from time to time. These hearings have become somewhat of a circus. We have an opportunity here. There's going to be at least three new members on this eight-member panel. And the issue that has been facing the Governor's Council in the past few years is too many people have dragged their political agenda into that council chambers. And it's time for that to stop. We've got a great opportunity to do that. Again, the primary job is to find qualified people and fill these judicial positions. It's not to try to embarrass the Lieutenant Governor or the Governor. It's not to make sure that they are in the state when the council meets. It's to, to interview people, make sure we got qualified people to handle these positions, and not look to be the top of the Boston Globe or any of the local papers. <laughs> it's to bring some sanity back to the position, and I believe, as I've done with the school committee in Westfield and several other boards, I believe I'm the man who can handle that job. I think you meant the Hampshire Gazette, not the Boston oh, well, yeah. Globe. But, uh, to me, in answer to the question, it, it's really all background music, and, and I say that because if you followed my career with the city, Springfield City Council and the school committee, uh, we've had some pretty epic battles. I fought, uh, took the uh, Food and Drug Administration on relative to prescription medications from Canada. So I've, I've gone back and forth in these battles. But in the final analysis, there's a nominee that comes before you, and you have to make sure that nominee is the right person. And uh, while there are a number of judicial appointments, there's also the Labor Relations Commission, there's the Industrial Accident Board, there's the Unit Compensation Review Board. There are a number of other boards that don't just involve the judiciary. So it's important to get good people on every single board. So I understand the controversy that's gone on. From what I know of my two colleagues here, you're not going to have that problem from the 8th District if one of us is elected. I can assure you of that. These are good guys. Uh, we'll make um, uh, good colleagues on, on, the, on the Governor's Council, and it will be well adjusted. But in the final analysis, it's who the Governor puts before you and how we react to that. And as I said at the beginning, I don't want to go backwards on relative to these social issues. I want to make sure that we continue to move forward. And that is so important that we have a governor who understands what the community wants, what the state wants. Uh, I don't think we want to go back to the Romney days. I know we don't. Uh, Mitt Romney terminated all of his judicial uh, nominating committee because he didn't like the type of appointments that was coming to him. Uh, so he took it on himself. I want to make sure that we have good progressive liberals in place. I'm looking for activist judges in certain courts. I'm looking for activist people to get involved and change social policy. That's the nature of this business. That's what the Governor's Council could do, and that's what I hope to bring, that philosophy and embrace those democratic traditions to the Governor's Council. Thanks. I'll follow up directly on that. Uh, the highest profile uh, appointments that you do consider as the Governor's Council are for the judici judiciary. What are the most important factors that you would weigh in considering judicial appointments? And how does the question of filling uh, vacancies in Western Massachusetts with Western Massachusetts residents play in your ranking of the important factors? It's my turn. Thank you, Stan. As I said in the opening, I think that's key to have 
Western Massachusetts people filling Western Massachusetts positions. We have many qualified people who can handle those jobs. As an attorney for the last 21 years, I understand what it takes to run the courthouse, whether it be a clerk's position, a district court position, housing court, all the way up to superior court, and then again at the SJC level. You understand what is required of those different positions if you're in front of them for 21 straight years. The job descriptions differ from level to level. So what you're looking for is someone who obviously is competent in that spot. Someone who's running a housing court has different qualifications from someone who's sitting on the SJC. In Westfield, we were, we were fortunate. One of the recent members who just stepped down from the SJC was John Graney. He started out as a housing court member up to a superior court and then made some great decisions that helped the democratic movement at the SJC level. He had the qualifications that you look for for those different positions and during his legal career was able to morph and to build on what he was able to do. That's what you're looking for, the qualified individuals understand the court system, understand the small communities. Again, the district courts out in this area are different from the district court and, and the municipal courts in the Boston area. We don't need people from Eastern Mass thinking they can come in here and determine how our courts should run. They don't understand the community. They don't understand the nuances. They don't understand how we operate in Western Massachusetts. If you go and you watch a superior court trial, you understand that that judge has to be able to control that courtroom, has to be able to make decisions, quick decisions, whether it be with the jury, whether it be on evidence, and there's hundreds of them during a major trial. You have to be competent, you have to be able to handle that position, and that's what I'll be looking for, and I'll understand what those jobs require. Thank you. I think the case has been made um, in, by past appointments by the governor of getting people from Eastern Massachusetts. That, that's not going to happen ever again here in the four western counties, and I'm absolutely committed to that. Having said that, I've had a chance in my career to have people work for me that have become district court judges. I'm very proud to say my associate city solicitor, Michael Mulcahy, is now a district court judge in Springfield District Court. Uh, another uh, associate, associate uh, city solicitor, uh, Patty Martinelli Poehler, is on the Palmer District Court, both work for me. I was very pleased to testify uh, for Judge Bill Boyle, who is now the Chief Justice of the District Court in Springfield. I've testified in the past for Michael Muse, who's a Superior Court uh, judge um, uh, in the Boston area. Um, but here, here's where I may differ from my colleagues, my friends. Uh, there will be a litmus test, as far as I'm concerned, on confirmation relative to marriage equality. There will be a litmus test relative to a woman's right to choose. There will be a litmus test relative to affirmative action. And I'm not going to sit there uh, like they do in the United States Senate and watch these judges dodge the question and say, I don't have an actual case in front of me. I don't know if I can vote this way or that way. It depends on the facts of the case. These are relatively um, easy questions to answer on a philosophical basis, and that's what I will be looking for uh, rel relative to the type of appointments uh, and nominees that I will approve as a governor's counselor. I, I, have, I, I take a little bit different approach. I think uh, with with too many too many panels and boards and that the people uh, there's just too many political connections and people will use those to get uh, other people into positions that uh, they want and it just it just becomes a vicious cycle of, of taking care of each other I'd be looking at political donations I'd be looking at, uh, at relationships the uh, in the in the uh, the upper court superior court um, you'd be looking for someone who can take charge without being uh, uh, a tyrant, uh, you know, someone that has the ability personality-wise that, that uh, commands a presence. And I think in the, in more in the family and, and uh, um, probate courts, you'd, you'd want somebody that uh, is, is um, more, uh, you know, have, has a gentler approach that can, that can deal with the public. Maybe it's their first time in court a lot of cases and uh, is more uh, accommodating and, and easier to approach. Um, along with the competency issues. So I think that, that's uh, a, a lot of, of what I'm looking for. To, to touch on Mr. Uh, Albano's uh, uh, remarks, um, I, don't, I don't look to exclude people. I look for, I would be looking for people that will, that have the ability to set aside their personal issues. I don't want activists either direction. I want someone that can say, this is how I feel. I can sit and, and decide, is this constitutional, is this um, you know, legal, based on the facts, not on their personal opinions. 
next question is back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Un under what circumstances would you say no to an appointment? How do you handle the pretty well qualified candidate who's clearly been put before you for political reasons? Well, if it's a if it's if it's a Romney type appointment who wants to uh, reverse Roe v. Wade, I'm going to say no. If it's somebody who comes before me, and there may be a Republican governor down the road who says that uh, marriage equality is not constitutional, I, I have a real issue with that, given the fact that there is a uh, precedent that's already been made. Um, so these are really important decisions. And, and I, as I said, um, marriage equality only passed by one vote of the SJC. I was the lead litigant in the suit against the Attorney General. The Attorney General tried to define marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, we took that issue on. I was the lead litigant with Michael Albano and others versus the Attorney General. And although we didn't win that case, it took that case went to the SJC, and then the case was ruled four to three that under the Constitution there is no, no prohibition against marriage equality. So these are the types of issues that I stand for. And I, as I said, I'm not going backwards. Uh, I, I'm very disturbed by hearing what Judge Scalia had to say uh, versus Roe. Uh, Roe v. Wade, that he would overturn it in a second. He said that it was a lie. He actually made the statement, uh, I think on CBS, it was a lie. Uh, he's made the statement relative to contraceptives, that case that goes back to 1966, the Connecticut case, that, that they were wrong. So there is a, a relative assault on women, and uh, I think it comes down to philosophy. I disagree with my friend, Counselor uh, uh, Roy, that there is a, a difference of, of philosophy. And I think we have to, as Democrats, embrace those democratic traditions. I've been a Democrat all my life. I'm a Kennedy Democrat. I'm proud of it. And uh, that tradition and that philosophy, I think, is critical when it comes to the Governor's Council on the confirmation of judicial appointments and also on the other boards and commissions that affect working families, like the Labor Relations Commission. Jerry. I think, I think you have to really look at the whole package that someone has to offer um, to, to exclude them for, you know, for an issue if they're, if they're an activist and they have a history of that and they're not, it's, it's, it's clear at that point that someone's really not able to put that aside. Then I can see that something like that is, is definitely not somebody that you would want in the courts. Um, but if, if someone just has, has beliefs, they've been, you know, worked their way up through, you know, whatever legal, legal uh, you know, commitments they've, they've had, I think you have to look at the whole package. I think to, to start denying people just because of a certain outlook on, on something, if, it, again, it goes to how much have they promoted that cause or how much have they done or are they just passively um, pro-life, pro-choice, whatever it is. I think, I think the, the intent, the extent of their involvement is, has a lot to do with it. Thank you. Again, one, one place where, where me and Mr. Albano do agree is on these strong democratic principles. I too have been a lifelong Democrat. I do firmly believe in the marriage equality, the workers' rights, the women's rights issues. And that would be key if we get to the point where we are appointing someone to the appellate division or to the SJC. Those issues become huge, insurmountable. West, uh, Westfield, Massachusetts has been on the cutting edge of, of making law across this country for the past decades. And, and I'm looking to continue that process. And as you see, it's crept into the national level and I think we can applaud the state and the judiciary for those movements. This, we could be appointing over 500 different positions on the Governor's Council. Again, you got to look as a case-by-case -case situation as to the qualifications of the person. So where those key elements are very important is the SJC. You've got to be looking also at the lower, the clerk's positions and the district court judges to make sure they're qualified. And again, Governor Patrick's already announced he's not running for re-election. We do not know who's going to be in that corner office in a couple of years. If it's a Republican, we've got to, as governor's counselors, be willing to stand up. The vetting process to the judicial nominating committee is a very good one at the present time. But we have got to be able to stand up to nominees who we do not believe the values are going to put forth what Massachusetts has become, that cutting edge law that has become so important to us. I will strongly um, urge nominees who are going to continue that process and I will be willing to vote against people who are not going to promote those values as we move forward for the next several years. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to another one of the duties of the uh, Governor's Council, and that's to review appointments to, to the parole board. 
What's your view of the current composition of the parole board and what changes would you seek to bring to the makeup through the appointment process? Mr. Jerry first. I think, I think they've, they've kind of taken a spin from giving everybody 15 chances at straightening out their lives and stop committing crimes to a uh, lock them up and leave them there uh, attitude. But uh, I, I think there's, there's got to be a happy medium in there somewhere. Um, I think you have to work with people that are better at reading people's um, potential to re recommit. Uh, crimes, um, and I think I think that I'm a pretty good reader of people. I think that you know a lot of people out there are. It uh, it's something that if you deal with the public every day, you're you're uh, better at. And uh, I think you need to you don't. I'm a firm believer in in you make your bed, you sleep in it. Yeah, the, the jails and that are are way over full, and we have we have way too much going on with with everything. But it. You know, are you going to stop putting people in jail because your jails are full? I, I don't. You know, you can't stop doing that. You just have to prioritize, I guess. But it's going to it's going to be uh, it's going to be people. I think that get in the, put into those positions that can can look at people and determine are you are you savable? And and, and that's going to be a tough call, I think, for for uh, for us. I've served on the parole board. I was on the parole board for. 12 years from 1982 to 1994. Governor King appointed me in 1982. Governor Dukakis reappointed me in 1987. And Governor Weld uh, reappointed me in 1992. Um, I understand the system. My, my belief in parole, 98 percent of the people who are sent to be incarcerated are coming back out on the street. Now, I've been to every single correctional institution in Massachusetts, except for the one at the vineyard. They didn't send me down there for some reason to do parole hearings. But you can have somebody walk out of Walpole if you want after serving 10 years and good luck. Or you can have them go to a pre-release and a gradual re-entry into the community and have parole supervision. That's my philosophy because 98 percent of the people are going to come out. Now you can do away with parole if you want. But in the end, you're going to have people sh serving shorter sentences and released with no supervision. I love Deval Patrick. I think he's a great governor. I think he made a big mistake in asking for the resignation of those parole board members because of that tragic case in Woburn. I really do. Nobody wanted to intentionally have that happen. You take the best information that you have before you and you make a judgment. And predicting human behavior is virtually impossible. So the parole board members did the best that they could. But understand that if they come out without supervision, it's going to be, uh, there's going to be more inclination to commit crimes, there's going to be more recidivism, and you're going to have a system that just is broken. I believe in the Massachusetts correctional system. I've seen it from top to bottom on the county level, on the state level. I've seen maximum security. I've seen pre-release. Parole works. It's a vital component. And I urge the governor and future governors to consider parole uh, in all aspects because it's a good, worthy system. My turn. Everyone wants to be tough on crime. I certainly do. Everyone runs on the platform, we are going to be tough on crime. It was an atrocious crime that was committed which led to the knee-jerk reaction of cleaning house on the parole board. Some, some would argue it was a political move. Some would argue it was just the right move. Personally. The Governor's Council's job, again, is to look at the individual candidates who are put before us for these positions, make sure they can judge on a case-by-case -case basis. Because with parole matters, there's a lot of gray area. You've got to look at that person and try to project what they are going to be like when they go back into the community, if you put them back into the community. We're Massachusetts. We give people second chances if they earn it. People sometimes make mistakes. Those mistakes are dangerous if it happens at the parole board level. Okay, so you have to make sure when that nominee is sitting in front of you, they understand their position. They too have to have integrity. They too have to be accountable for their actions. The parole boards are very serious and obviously one that's going to be watched for several years to come. I'm committed to making sure we have the proper people on that board to make sure they understand their job and again to make sure they're qualified to undertake that position. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move into the audience questions now. And they have a one minute time limit, so you have half as much time as you did. I just want to remind you of the order. Mike always <laughs> goes after Kevin. Jerry always goes after there. Mike. I'm Kevin sorry. always goes after Jerry. All right. So, <laughs> um, so the first question is, 
Uh, first of all, it goes to Kevin first. Um, would you take a nominee's position on same-sex marriage, choice, poor people's issues into account in voting on a nominee? Absolutely. And as we've talked about earlier tonight, depending again on the position they're talking, but the people who are going to be making those decisions are the upper echelons of our judicial system, the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Judicial Court, and those positions are key. Again, Massachusetts has been cutting edge across the country. We do not want to go backwards. We do not want to be seen, because if Massachusetts goes backwards, it gives the rest of the country the opportunity to step back as well. I think the President made a good decision several months ago when he came out in support of same-sex marriage. I think it was a long time in coming quite honestly. This is one of those issues that you would think with the United States this should have been decided 30 years ago if it ever had to be decided quite honestly. So yes, my position would be I certainly would take that into account for those positions that are going to be policy making positions. Thank you. Uh, my answer has been yes in the past and uh, I'll continue to uh, be a strong advocate for those positions. It, it, let me say that back in 2002 when we took on the Attorney General I was the only elected official on that question that went before them. So I've had a history of this. I, as mayor, appointed the first gay liaison to the, uh, uh, liaison to the gay community. I was the first mayor in the country to give domestic benefits, be domestic partnerships to gay couples. So I've, I've been on the forefront of this cause and I'll continue to do that. Relative to people of color, I've talked about my record on diversity. I will continue to have a litmus test for judges. And I, I don't make any apology for using that terminology. I really don't. I know others do, but I don't. We're not going to go backwards in this Commonwealth. We're a great state, and it's because we've had good judicial decisions in the past, and I want to keep uh, Massachusetts num as, as uh, one of the number one states in America. I'll make the same, the same comment they had before, where um, I think you have to look at the whole package on people. I mean, if they're, again, if they're uh, on the judicial side of things, if they're, if they're activists in some way uh, or other, I, I think that should be a red flag. I think people, we have, we have too much of, I'm going to say arguing, but it's, it's too much of taking sides and, and not simply getting together to work out a problem. And, and, and I think that's what we have to get away from by, you know, the, the hard line, whether it's one you know, side of a topic or another, we need to kind of figure out somewhere in the middle to work it out. And I think by having, you know, by bringing activists into the, into the judiciary, I think that's good, you know, that's just going to accelerate the problem and then the next Republican may be governor then he's got his activists going in the opposite direction and then we're not getting anywhere on anything. I think, I think we need to kind of uh, get the rhetoric down a little bit and work out some issues and uh, I think that would, we'd, you know, we'd be better off. We'd just be better off. Alright, so the next question goes to Michael first. Um, several decades ago the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts tried to abolish the Governor's Council. What do you believe is the chief reason the council should continue to exist? I believe that somebody has to draw conclusions and make confirmations on the governor's appointees. In some states, it's the state senate. In some states, it's the House of Representatives. It has to be somebody. Now, in Massachusetts, we could have Tom Finneran or Bill Bulger. And that, that would have been our choices a few years ago. We could, today, we'd have Terry Murray or Bob DeLeo, both good people but they control their chambers and there's an inherent conflict of interest because they also rule and make judgments on the budgets of those uh, decisions that they, that they make relative to judges and courts. So somebody has to do it. I would prefer an elected body, eight districts of the Governor's Council. I think it makes sense to have a check and balance on the appointees of the Governor and also on the warrants, the money that is, uh, that is legislated by the Governor and the Legislature. I think an elected body makes more sense than to have the House or the Senate. Jerry. I, I, uh, I agree with a lot of that. Um, the, uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, what can, what, I mean, what are the choices? Are we going to, are we going to put it in the hands of our representatives and senators? Uh, you know, it's just one more thing that uh, we may criticize them for. Um, I'd, I'd actually like to see something where local government officials are more, maybe they would elect somebody that's regional instead of the, the electorate, maybe it may, you know, either way. But I think it's, it's a necessary, uh, it's a necessary body, however you form it, as a, uh, like, you know, like uh, Mr. Albano said, it's a check and balance and that's, that's, you know, part of, I think, what's making us 
us a you know a decent state and a decent country is uh, you know a, a little bit of restriction on, on you know you never know who you're getting in and what what they're going to run with and we need to have a way to stop you know, stop the uh, the person that has something to push. I think you actually found an issue we all agree on. <laughs> there has to be a backstop to a governor's ability to appoint, again, up to 500 positions across the state. There has to be a mechanism in place as a check and balance. That's what this country is based on and it has to be there. If the legislator and then ultimately the citizens of Massachusetts through a referendum decide they'd rather put it in the hands of the Senate, so be it. Right now, the Governor's Council is a necessary body which puts the check on the Governor's ability to fill the court system. Again, Governor Patrick, Lieutenant Governor Murray have done a great job of recognizing Western Massachusetts, but that hasn't always been the case. We need some ability to put a check on their uh, appointment of, of this judicial nominees. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, the next question goes to Jerry first. Is affirmative action still relevant? Should it play a role in the Governor's Council? Well, as far as the Governor's Council, I, I think that I think that um, it's unfortunate that everybody doesn't have the same opportunities. I mean, um, you know, I think I think that sometimes affirmative action uh, and even like the Hampshire uh, College uh, thing here recently with the uh, the money for immigrants, uh, illegal uh, children to, to go to uh, school there. I think a lot of things like that become lightning rods, and they they. They really should be approached, I think, in a, in a different way that would make them less confrontational. Um, the affirmative action part of things, I think you have to, you have to, you know, do what you can to, you know, if we had different schools that taught things differently, I think community colleges could be a huge asset for a lot of inner city uh, individuals. It, uh, there's a lot of different ways I think that, that sh it should be approached, but I, I can't say that you should stop any of it. The question is, is affirmative action relevant? And unfortunately, I think the answer still is yes. Hopefully, we will get to that day where it's not relevant, where everyone has got the same opportunity to move forward. Unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. So again, affirmative action is one of these democratic qualities that I have firmly adhered to for my entire life. It's one of those other tests that we'll be talking about when we get a nominee in front of us as their position to it. Again, the goal is obviously to make the playing field fair to everyone who is going to sit on the judiciary, who is going to be leading our court system. The answer is right now, it certainly still is a, a relevant topic. Thank you. There's no question about it. The Supreme Court of the United States may take up the issue again this fall relative to affirmative action on college admissions. Uh, I think I know what the vote's going to be. I think you do too. It's going to be five to four. Most likely it's going to get flipped. It's going to come back. And the state courts are going to have to intercede once again. So it absolutely is an issue. Look. I, I, I've served for 32 years. I haven't seen many people of color make it to the bench. I haven't seen many Asian Americans. I haven't seen very many women. I haven't seen very many gays, lesbians. Uh, I haven't seen enough. I'm not satisfied that we've made the progress that we should be at at this point in time. Have we made progress in Massachusetts? Yes. That's why I don't want to go back. And that's why I will have a litmus test relative to affirmative action. But we can do a lot better. A lot, lot better and have more diversity on the bench, more diversity in the clerk's office, more diversity on all these boards and commissions. I attended a governor's council meeting the other day and a governor's counselor got up and said to the lieutenant governor, we have not had one person of color on the industrial accident board in her 18 years on the council. That is simply wrong. Thanks. So here's the last audience question. It goes to Kevin first. Will you actively support President Obama and Elizabeth Warren in November? Please Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I was very excited four years ago watching the President give his initial addresses, the energy that was there. And that's something that we, we haven't been able to duplicate, but hopefully we will here very shortly. Professor Warren was in Westfield the other day. We took her around the city with my family, showed her the work that has been done there. I offer the same invitation to the President if he'd like to come tour Westfield with us. But I absolutely, again, those strong democratic values that have, have given Massachusetts its name and its place in this country are going to be fulfilled by hopefully Senator Warren and then again with re-electing the President. So I absolutely wholeheartedly support both their candidacies. To take a line from Lloyd Benston, who was running for Vice President, he said, I know, in this case, Mitt Romney. I've worked with Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is no friend of Massachusetts, nor will he be a friend to the middle working class of the United States of America. 
So it's not even a close call. This is a huge philosophical difference here. Huge. He's going to change. He could tip the balance of the Supreme Court. Uh, Obama has done a good job inherited an awful budget from George W. Uh, we can do a lot better. And I've never been, I've watched politics since uh, I was 10 years old. I've never seen a more exciting candidate than Elizabeth Warren. She's going to make a great United States Senator, but we've got to get our act together to get her elected. We've got a long road ahead of us, I believe. The polls are not looking good today. Uh, I don't think they're looking good um, uh, on the national level for Obama at, the, at this point. So we've got to come together as Democrats to make sure that these two individuals get elected. The future of the country is at stake. Jerry. I'm going to be the one on this board that takes the, uh, the, the uh, oath of silence. <laughs> um, I actually, um, Romney's obviously not, not the choice, but uh, I, I want to comment on a couple things. First, as far as Elizabeth Warren, I, I was at the state convention, and uh, it, really, it really struck me as, as underhanded the way that the Democratic Party really took, took uh, Marissa DeFranco and, and threw her under the bus. I don't think that was appropriate for them. Um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm saying that, and I, I think I was the only one in the, in the Senate district that, that voted to let her um, you know, get on the ballot. That wasn't right. For her to go out and get all the signatures, the 10 plus thousand signatures and certified and everything, and then have, and then have it, uh, everybody you know, pile on and, and uh, against her, that wasn't right. So her, I didn't, I'm not a fan of, of uh, Elizabeth Warren's just because of her small business. Uh, you know, we built this small business. I've worked 60, 70 hours a week building a business. Nobody was there helping me. So that part of her, I don't agree with. I think you have to have someone that's representative on both sides, including, uh, I think, Scott Brown, whether he's the right one or not, at least what he minute, does sorry. is roughly half and half, and that's how the state's divided, I think, roughly. Thanks. It's time for closing arguments. We're going to start with Michael. I just want to thank, again, the audience for being here, the viewers watching on television. I want to thank my colleagues who are both good guys who make good governor's counselors. I've enjoyed campaigning with them. Uh, my name is Michael Albano in closing. Uh, I'd like to be your governor's counsel from this district. I think my background and experience uh, merits your uh, close review. I've had a chance uh, to work for the citizens of Springfield and Massachusetts for 32 years in public life. I'm honored to say that the Massachusetts AFL-CIO has endorsed me. I think it's the first time they've ever endorsed a candidate for governor's counsel. The Pioneer Valley AFL-CIO, my good friends, the Springfield Patrol Officers uh, Union has endorsed me, and the Pittsfield Firefighters. I come from a family of blue collar. I'm very proud to say I'm very proud to wear it this evening. Uh, this is about um, the middle income families of Massachusetts. It's about good, solid appointments. Uh, I think I'm qualified. I'm ready for the job. I'm looking forward to the challenge. And I would appreciate your consideration of my experience, my background on September 6th. Jerry's next. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, for coming, everyone. Um, I'm Jerry Roy. And uh, it's. It, it, it's difficult for me uh, sometimes because I, as a city councilor in Chicopee, I do I take the time, I do all the homework, and I don't let p politics p play a part in, in my decisions. Uh, as these guys next to me, and they're decent guys, th but they they've got the political connections. They've got 30 years of political connections. I mean, I, I don't think we had a question where there wasn't a job that Ms. Mr. Albano had, uh, or two in the same department. Um, and Mr. Sullivan's, you know, got his brother at the at, at on Beacon Hill and that. And I mean, the, the, the connections are, are decades old. And if, and if you if you like that idea, you know, it's the same thing with you know whether it's you know Monsanto running the FDA or whatever else. It's 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 relationships that that we need to get free from. We need to, s to break the circle where everybody takes care of somebody else and then they take care of somebody else. And we need to get away from that. I have no friends that are lawyers. I have no friends that are politicians or judges. And I'm the only impartial, impartial person on this board. And I'd, I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to address the people of Hampshire County. One of the other events they asked, what's your favorite part of this election cycle, and I said, that's easy. Getting the people working out in the 96 cities and towns and trying to gain the support of some of our citizens. Who supported me this weekend? Congressman John Over endorsed me. I've got the endorsement of the present Governor's Council, Tom Merrigan. I've got District Attorney Dave Sullivan. State Senator Stan Rosenberg has cut commercials for me. State Reps Peter Kogut, Ellen Story. The Mayor, David Narkowitz, has been a great supporter. We had a good fundraiser over at Fitzwillie. City Councils like Jesse Adams and others. And the reason they're supporting me is they know that 
I will bring to this job the same integrity, accountability, and competence that I bring to the 21 years I've been an attorney, to the job I do on the Westfield School Committee, and I hope I can earn your support just like I've earned these other public officials. On September 6th, Thursday, September 6th, I'm asking for your vote. I'm Kevin Sullivan, and I'm running for Governor's Council. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Thank you all for staying for Act Two. And thanks to our <laughs> panel. And thanks to our timekeepers and thanks to our, our sponsors. And, yeah. <laughs> and thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.